and every role I've been at, right? So when I moved from a technical role to a, a business role, when I moved from a business role into customer success and revenue and so forth, there were already these like amazing superstars that already like done it. Like right. some of the folks that I worked with, like engineering, they were like born engineers. I can solve any problem. I was just learning the ropes back then. Um, when I went to the world of business and consulting, like they were like tenured consultants that could just go to a customer and make magic happen, right? Uh, when you move to customer success, right? There's so many experienced customer success folks or folks that are even like newer in their career, but they're like, kill it. And he was like, this is amazing. Like, I want to learn from you, right? Um, but in the process, you always think, cause like, am I worthy to be in this room with this person, right? Like, they seem to be the the legend and uh, uh, am, I, am I worthy to be here? In this week's episode, I speak with a former candidate turned friend of mine, Sunil, who is most recently the global VP of customer success at Stack Overflow. This one's filled with insights into how he's built and scaled high performing customer success teams. But as usual, that's almost secondary. He'll share with us what it was like to grow up in India, the sacrifices he had to make in order to pursue his dreams and the confidence required to do so. It's easy to look at people like Sunil who've accomplished so much and forget that we all start at the bottom. And even when we've reached significant milestones in our own careers, there's always someone next door who's a couple steps ahead. I'm thrilled to say that while it's only episode five, this podcast has become a platform where leaders can share not only their professional learnings, but their personal ones as well. I'm Sarah Roberts, and you're listening to Success Unscripted. Thank you for thank you for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. So, um, I thought we would start with just kind of going through your background. I, I know you most recently were Global VP of Success at Stack Overflow. But like everybody else on this podcast, you didn't start in success. So, yeah. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Yeah. So, yeah, I've had a very nonlinear journey, uh, like a lot of people do. I started as a builder. I was an engineer for the first three years of my career. So I moved into the world of advisory. Uh, I went to grad school and interned at Wall Street and then went into management consulting for five years. Mm -hmm. And then from there on, for the last eight years or so, I've been moving to the world of B2B SaaS um, and kind of the scale side of things. So I started as a builder, moved into the world of advisory, and then from there on, moved the world of B2B SaaS and scale. Very cool. And what, if you can think back, like, what was the catalyst for each of those transitions? Yeah. I think the catalyst was learning. And I think that was uh, something that was important for me personally. Um, I would say two things that are important for me. One is impact. And then second is learning. Um, and there's this term called skill stacking, which I'm a huge uh, fan of, uh, which is trying to kind of round off skills that you don't have or you want to learn. So when I was an engineer, a lot of my skills were technical, mm. but I wasn't able to translate that into business requirements and kind of understanding the world of like, what happens in these boardrooms and discussions and so forth. So I wanted to learn that skill and that moved me to the world of business. And I was like, okay, I've rounded off those skills that are required there. But then what I didn't have is how do I kind of think about scaling this? Not just like 10x, 100x, 1000x, a million x, right? How do you do that? And that moved me to the world of kind of scale. So it was always about kind of learning things that I didn't know. And also in the pursuit of like really kind of understanding those different things. So the two words, impact and learn. Yeah. And so w one of the themes that's naturally come up a lot in this podcast has been like how to leverage your past experiences in your current role. And yeah. so going from engineering to consultancy to customer success, do you uh, call upon skills that, that you've learned in those other industries and roles? Absolutely. Um, so a lot of kind of what I do in my roles today is very different than what I used to do maybe 15 years back. Um, but a lot of that translates into what I do today. So mm -hmm. although the roles look very different, 
the fundamental principles remain the same. And one of the things that I always think about while solving problems is thinking from first principles, uh, which is kind of breaking things down to their minute parts and trying to kind of rebuild that back up again. So even when I was a kid, I used to love you know, looking at an alarm clock, breaking it down, although my mom didn't like it, <laughs> uh, and then kind of putting it back together. Maybe it might or might not work, but uh, it was very interesting to kind of break down those individual parts see how they work individually and then try to kind of fit them together. So that's kind of what's interesting to me is like really finding the truth of what exists and then putting it back together into something that's even better than what existed before. Yeah. And would you say that that stems from your like builder dev background? Absolutely. Yeah. So I think the builder piece was really, really helpful for me personally, um, especially because it gave me an appreciation of, finding truth in terms of how things work um, and finding kind of the intricate details of like how a line of code works, how it impacts something, what's the efficiency of that. Um, and that kind of always kind of gave me the construct of really kind of breaking things down to its minute pieces, making sure that works well and how does that work well with the other pieces of the puzzle. So even when I lead teams, I start thinking about how do I empower every single skill that a person's doing? How do I kind of ensure every single person is successful? And that kind of ensures the overall success of the team, of the company and so forth. So the fundamentals kind of remain the same, which is kind of break it down to its most minute pieces and then building it back up again. Company building is the same as building a product, is the same as like engineering. So mm -hmm. a lot of these pieces kind of translate with each other. Yeah. And you've, in in past conversations, you've talked about the concept of the art of the possible. Mm -hmm. And I, I just love that. And we, we, we haven't really gone too deep in it because I wanted to yeah. <laughs> wait for you to describe it today. But tell me, um, tell me where that comes from and how that impacts your work. Uh, well, I think we have to go way back for that, uh, <laughs> maybe childhood. <laughs> but um, I think the art of the possible really comes from the fact of, I would say number one is, um, always kind of thinking about not giving up and always kind of pushing through things. Number two is um, there is always a way to solve a problem. We're really kind of looking towards kind of what are you trying to really solve for um, and what are the outcomes you're trying to drive. So I think it's also important to not have perfection in what you do because I think sometimes when, when I was in IC and when I started my career, a lot of that was like around kind of perfection sometimes. And I've learned pretty soon that it's, it's okay to kind of have an MVP. It's okay to have like an initial product that is kind of maybe subpar and you can actually build on top of that and make it much better. So I think really kind of understanding all the constraints you're working through um, and not just kind of perfection, not being the only kind of aspect of it, there are other ways to kind of build that out. Yeah. And I think the number three is um, really kind of thinking about pushing the envelope a little bit because sometimes we think about when you think about the art of the possible, right? You're thinking about what can I do within the constraints of what I'm given and the art of the possible, the way I think about it, like, how can you think about externalities? How can you think about other things outside your universe that can kind of really help you? Like a really great example is when you're an engineer, you're trying to kind of build off of the frameworks that you have, um, the code you're given uh, and so forth. But there could be other libraries that are out there, kind of other interesting kind of pieces that you can uh, inherit and build on top of that might not exist in your current universe. So I think that's kind of one thing I learned as an engineer. When I moved to the world of business, it was a lot of about the requirements we are working with customers, but there are other things in, that were happening in the industry that could be kind of interesting that we could bring on to solving certain problems or the products that other companies are building or the kind of problem ways companies are solving problems that could be brought over to another customer. So it was interesting to kind of translate those externalities um, and especially in customer success, where to apply it. Um, and then kind of, I know we're going to de delve a little bit deeper into that as well, but it's not just about um, ensuring your customers are happy and successful and so forth. That's kind of one part of it, but how you're driving towards revenue, how are, how you're driving towards value, how you're unlocking that. I feel it's a combination of um, kind of really looking outside your universe and not just kind of sticking to what's working for you so far. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, I, I want to get a little bit for a minute, get a little bit more tactical on more specifically your position at Stack Overflow. Yep. And as the VP of global success, 
what were some of your biggest KPIs that you were working towards? And then also if you could dig in a little bit more into that scale piece. Yeah, so um, at Stack Overflow, I was responsible to drive the post-sale motion for our B2B business, um, which is uh, called Teams, um, that companies use to really kind of collaborate and really, really build their whole community together. Uh, and the key KPIs I was driving was net dollar retention and gross dollar retention at the end of the day, which is the NRR, GRR, NDR, uh, uh, GDR, that as you call it. But again, those are lagging indicators from my perspective. The leading indicators that really kind of help you control those is how you're really kind of helping customers get to value as quickly as possible. So I think the value piece becomes as important as possible earlier in the journey. Um, because sometimes what happens is you're into a contract nine months in and then you're having a conversation with a customer and saying like, hey, here's how much value we've created. It's too late uh, to have that conversation because right. customers have already right. set their budget. They've already kind of had discussions internally. Um, so we want to continuously show that value as early as possible and as continuously as possible. So a lot of my role was focused on unlocking that value at every point in time with customers uh, and doing that across different tiers because uh, my responsibilities mm -hmm. included everything from our strategic customers all the way to our SMB tier. Uh, so how do you do that across all those different tiers, not just for your largest enterprise customers that you have the best relationship with, you can have ongoing conversations with, but there might be customers that you're, you're not speaking to uh, even once every three months uh, in person. So how are you able to get those signals, not just from those internal conversations you're having, but also from the product data as well. Yep. Uh, so I think it's a combination of my role was being able to forecast the business while being able to look at the leading indicators of the business. Um, so it's kind of that art and science of looking at what's going on now and being able to forecast six months out how the business is going to be able to do and, and scale further. And so how do you uncover or document or track or drive that value for those different tiers? I think the most important thing was is defining what your value drivers are. Every customer has got a unique problem they're trying to solve. At the end of the day, every customer is buying a product because they want to get value out of it and they want to solve a specific problem. And the second piece of the puzzle is really as you're kind of doing that value discovery, you're also kind of bringing your team together. And because a lot of the customer success teams, as you've seen and I've seen, they're very unique. Um, the teams can kind of vary everything from like, hey, we have very strategic conversations with customers to very technical conversations. So there's that whole kind of proactive, predictive, reactive play that we talk about, um, and they can fall into kind of any of those. Um, so really, I think at the end of the day, it's a combination of like understanding what, what you're trying to solve for customers as early as possible and really kind of bringing your team and your customer success motion aligned to those particular value drivers that you're trying to solve for. And what's the rhythm of your business, right? What is that kind of heartbeat of your business that's gonna help customers achieve the outcomes they're trying to do? Um, and I think sometimes it's also um, can be misconstrued for like score watching, uh, because, because what can happen is as the business scales, um, and when you're kind of earlier stage of the business, you're all building it together, you like have an understanding of where every customer is, yeah what's going on with them, you know every customer by name, and then lo and behold, you are at like 50 million and it's very hard to like keep a track of every single customer and where things are, right? So um, I think it's important to really kind of have that kind of pulse of the business where you can still have an indication of where every customer is every single day, every single week, every single month, and then you have those kind of proactive plays that you can run to correct things when they are not working the way they are. And I think that's that's a DNA that needs to be brought into the organization. Everybody on the team needs to be able to drive towards that, not just within the customer success function, but across the business to be able to do that. Product, marketing, sales, finance, all of these folks are partners in the process. And I, I truly believe customer success is a company function. It's not a team. And CS comes in to be the catalyst for that particular change and help kind of drive and shepherd that. Uh, but being able to do that more cross-functionally and being able to drive that is, is highly, highly important. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about how you structured the team at Stack Overflow. Yeah. The way I built the team was based on customer journey. So the first thing I did was really kind of try to understand what is our customer journey. And a lot of the times customer journey um, and different folks think about this differently. Um, the way I think about it is always thinking from a customer's perspective, right? What is the value that we need to unlock for customers? And what are those milestones that we need to achieve to unlock that value from a customer's perspective? Um, so my first kind of initial couple of weeks I spent talking to customers, really kind of understanding kind of their value motion. How are they looking to kind of solve those problems as quickly as possible? And what does value mean to them, right? What are those maybe 
four to five things that happen from their organizational perspective where they can feel that they're unlocking value. What are those water cooler discussions? What are the things they see in the product? Mm -hmm. What are the things they're seeing from a revenue perspective or an efficiency perspective that gives them the indicator that we bought the right product, we bought the right team in, and we are seeing value. So having those initial discovery conversations was important to really build out a customer journey, uh, which is an outside in customer journey. Our customers are telling us this is how they expect value to be uncovered. So once you have top to enough customers, your pattern matching across your strategic through SMB customers, um, building out that customer journey, and then segmenting team according to that. So when we when I in, initially inherited the team, uh, our CSMs were doing everything. Mm. They were doing the implementation, they were doing the actual success side, they were also doing renewals, and they were also taking tickets um, and working with our support team and solving that. They were doing support too? Wow. Yeah, so any kind of escalations, tickets that used to come through, the customers would send us like kind of requests through, obviously not the tier one tickets, and we had like a dedicated team that could kind of manage through that but kind of any elevated requests that would come through, our team would kind of get into that um, and really try to kind of help customers through it. Mm -hmm. um, so your CSM is literally doing every part of the customer journey. So it's very hard for them to focus and unlock that initial value and so forth. So they were kind of running through a process, uh, not really kind of trying to unlock the value at different pieces. So the first thing I had to do was really try to understand how to split the team up in a way where they can specialize in different parts of the business. So how do you think about the initial kind of activation and onboarding phase? How do you think about the ongoing kind of adoption and growth journey? And really kind of splitting the team based on that. So the first step was to really kind of experiment. What, what if we were to really separate out the first piece of the journey to get customers to initial value? But let's experiment and see. Yep. And then we were able to kind of prove that we were able to reduce the time to value pretty substantially uh, in the first couple of weeks and months with customers. We would also help our other CSMs in the team Really, be really focused on driving that adoption and growth with customers yes. uh, and then eventually kind of running the renewal play. And then what happened at the end of the day is like, took the customer journey, we saw the first part be successful. So we scaled that team up uh, to be able to kind of work with customers, not just on the implementation side and the post sale, but also help with our uh, proof of value and pilots that we did with customers. Uh, and then the post sale side, be able to kind of scale that journey on the CSM side so they can have more value focused discussions and then partner better with sales to be able to bring those kind of renewal upsell conversations earlier. Um, so we CSMs don't have to do the entire process of showing value, running adoption, doing the renewals and commercials. We can partner with sales and have that kind of two in one effect where we have a larger team that's working with different personas. We have those personas mapped yep. and we have a larger team that's going and kind of winning that deal for us. Um, I really saw our NDR go up due to that pretty substantially because we had different um, focus for different folks in the team. We also had this partnership model that kind of helped us kind of drive towards that growth and scale. Yeah. And so by making that switch, you saw the net dollar retention increase. What was the impact on the your team's happiness yeah. and drive? So I think there's three things that helped on the team side. One is it helped, um, reduce a lot of stress in the team because initially they were doing every part of the process very really hard to keep up with um, one customer is an implementation, another customer is just having a renewal conversation. I have this customer that's growing like crazy, like should we, let's kind of go and get a case study. So there were 15 tasks that a CSM was doing a day um, and all of them were the right task to do, but probably not possible for one person to kind of drive towards uh, that and do it with kind of high quality. So the first one was like reduction and stress in the team uh, because they were able to kind of focus on five things and do those five things really well. The second thing was having a defined way of really kind of running their day to day, uh, which is having that rhythm of the business. So they know what I'm doing on a Monday, what I'm doing on a Tuesday. And again, it, it was a journey. It wasn't like day one, like here's kind of what we need to do, right? So we as a team built that together in terms of different kind of uh, pieces of how you run your business on a daily basis. So there was more structure to how they ran their business um, as compared to having it a little more ad hoc like they had before. Uh, and then number three on the happiness front is um, there was more collaboration across the board. Mm. So initially when you are a CSM, you're driving every part of the journey, you kind of own the end-to-end -end process. Um, but now when you have kind of different pieces of the puzzle, where now you're talking about sales, you're talking to marketing, you're talking to, talk to product as there is, high impact feature requests that are coming in or uh, product gaps and so forth. Um, you're having that kind of higher collaboration and there's very clearly defined racy between 
how you interact between different teams. Uh, and that was important, right? When we started, we were a very small team. And as we are revenue scaled uh, and, our, and our team expanded, it became even more important to have those connective tissues and have that construct and what's my protocol, right? I mean, going back to the, the engineering side of things, what's the protocol? How am I gonna handshake between teams? I'm gonna make sure the information's passed, but how are we also collaborating uh, through the process? So yep. I would say those were the three things that really kind of helped the happiness in the team. And um, we could see this high collaboration where it was like on every kind of team meeting, we would have a session around learnings. Like, what did you learn this week? Where did you fail at things? Like share your learnings, wins and failures. And the team was very open to sharing like, hey, here's what worked, here's what didn't work, right? And others would chime in and say, oh, actually this worked on my account, like let's talk offline, right? And that was great where the team was solving these problems together and it was creating this kind of great energy on the team that was driving towards kind of winning together uh, as compared to winning by myself on certain set of accounts. I love, well, I love the the practice of um, talking about wins and failures on a regular basis because it, it kind of makes it less, um, like less of less taboo. Yeah. It becomes just part of a practice and and part of the learning. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite um, entrepreneurs, Sarah Blakely, the founder of Spanx, she always talks about how her dad at or maybe it was both her parents. I don't know, but at the dinner table, they would always say okay, what's something that you failed at today? Yeah. And it was like a bad thing if you couldn't think of something. Um, and just making failure a part of the growth process. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I, I wanted to talk a little bit about yeah. with you um, more deeply is that, you know, no matter who you are or what your role is, um, failure and disappointment is, is part of the journey. If you are going to be a very successful person in anything, yeah. part of that process is getting out of your comfort zone mm -hmm. and doing things that aren't guaranteed to succeed. Yeah. But part of becoming, you know, an actualized human is also dealing with those disappointments, those failures, yeah. whatever you want to call them, um, and, and not getting totally crushed by them yeah. and to, and, and to learn and grow through those challenges. And so yeah. I think we all have, I think we all have like those knee jerk reactions mm -hmm. to, to failure or disappointment. Yeah. And it's important over time to, learn how to respond in a more productive way. And so can you remember any specific times where things didn't go the way that you had planned or you had a challenging time in mm -hmm. your career and, and how do you approach those moments? Yeah. I don't think a podcast would be enough to cover all my failures. <laughs> I think I would talk for weeks. <laughs> um, but let me try to kind of touch on a different theme, right? Um, and you and I have talked about this in the past. And um, I, I think the one, and I think, uh, let me just kind of be back in a little bit, right? Uh, and I think this might be a story for a lot of different people, maybe in different situations. But one of the things I've deal, dealt with, and I'm going to specifically talk about failure, but let me kind of touch on a different topic, which is um, imposter syndrome. And uh, that's something that I've dealt with throughout my career. And again, a lot of people kind of, Put that as a it has a negative connotation, but it can also be uh, motivating in a way, right? So I think there's kind of two paths to it. It's kind of how you think about imposter syndrome is also kind of important as well. And um, but again, I've never I've not had that level of maturity until kind of lately to start thinking about it in kind of two different dimensions. Because um, and I've, it also kind of took me a lot of time and a lot of years to even figure out like is this. It's called imposter syndrome. It has a name, right? right. Sometimes you just don't even know growing up. Um, so just going to back up a little bit. Um, so I grew up in India. I was born and raised there. And um, a, a lot of kind of going through the academic system in India requires, doesn't require, but I think if you have to kind of unlock the next level for yourself in being able to kind of get into certain jobs or certain kind of professions and you want to achieve what you want to achieve, you have to be at the top of the cream to be able to do that. 
Um, and there is, I think, two dimensions to it. One is the kind of be always on like the top one, two, or three, right? Like come the first, second, or third in your class to be able to do that, right? Um, and the second dimension is as you're doing it, right? Do you really have that innate kind of feeling that I want to go succeed? Are you doing it just to crack the system, right? And and keep up yep. with your peers or keep up with the system to be able to get there. And I've always struggled with that, right? And the thing that was helpful for me is like always had this innate need to always have this curiosity, have this impact in the world, uh, want to always learn something. So that's kind of what I used as a fuel to be like, okay, I'm going to be curious. I'm going to learn stuff. And whatever it kind of gets me to, it doesn't matter the outcome, but if it gets me to kind of unlocking the next level, let's do that. Right. So I've always kind of used that as the, the lever, but I think the first aspect, which is like keeping up with your peers and keeping up with where things are. And once you get to a certain point, not just academically, but also in your career, it becomes kind of important to keep your eye that it's, it's your own journey and you're kind of on your own kind of, you're running your own race yeah. in a way. Um, as compared to obviously like getting inspired from others is very, very important, right? Like you mentioned by Sarah Blakely. And so there's always going to be important to kind of look up to people that have done certain things that inspire you. Um, but also it's their journey and it's like, how, what are the things you can learn from them? Uh, and then how can you kind of move on from there? Right. So and there's been specific kind of times in my life where I had to question that imposter syndrome. Uh, so I worked for the first three years of my career as an engineer. And uh, the reason I, uh, kind of work for three years was I wanted to save enough money to go to grad school. Um, mm. And uh, by the time I had graduated uh, my uh, uh, high school, my parents had retired by then. Um, and um, uh, so we didn't have enough like funds to be able to like go and kind of have that ability to kind of go for higher studies. So I wanted to be able to like, um, save enough so I can kind of go unlock that next level, which is I wanted to go study, learn those skills that I wanted to, right? Um, but I always had this imposter thing, like, am I even qualified to go to higher studies? Would that even be a possibility, right? Not just because I had the drive to go do it, but financially, would that, how would that impact my family, right? Because I had to take a student loan. Um, right. And the way things work in different countries are very different. In India, you have to actually put a collateral to be able to do that. Um, it's not just, you can't just go off a credit score. We didn't have that concept back then. Uh, I mean, my things mm -hmm. might've changed now, but um, so it was always that pressure of like making sure like you're taking care of others. Like you have your own aspirations, what you want to do, but you also want to make sure it doesn't create undue stress on your family and your friends yeah. and surroundings and so forth. So I, I feel like that was the first time that I questioned it, not just because of my drive, but because of like how it would impact others. And every role I've been at, right? So when I moved from a technical role to a, a business role, when I moved from a business role into customer success and revenue and so forth, there were already these like amazing superstars that already like done it. Like right. some of the folks that I worked with, like engineering, they were like born engineers. I can solve any problem. I was just learning the ropes back then. Um, when I went to the world of business and consulting, like they were like tenured consultants that could just go to a customer and make magic happen, right? Uh, when you move to customer success, right? There's so many experienced customer success folks or folks that are even like newer in their career, but they're like, kill it. And he was like, this is amazing. Like, I want to learn from you, right? Um, but in the process, you always think of like, am I worthy to be in this room with this person, right? Like, they seem to be the the legend and uh, uh, am, I, am I worthy to be here? So it's, I think that question always comes up, but I think you always have to bring yourself to the reality of it. So and I'm not giving you specific situations, but I would say like that's been a consistent uh, journey of mine. I would say struggle. Yes, I did struggle with that for a long time. A, to define what even the word for that is, but then B, really yeah. trying to kind of make um, make the positive side of it happen, right? But I want to actually put that question back to you because um, you grew up in the Bay Area, right? Like nothing more intense than kind of living in the Bay Area, having high achievers around you. Yep. And obviously you, you've you succeeded in, in your life, right? And if you look at the society, your, your success story and like the leaders you've created, like the interactions I've had with you, right? Like you inspire me, right? So for when, when the world looks at you, you are a success story. But then I'm assuming like going through that journey in the Bay Area, like having your peers that were high achievers, how was that, right? Would love to kind of learn from you. How was your yeah. experience? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think I also chose to be in even more of a 
pressure cooker situation. And, um, my, so I, yes, I grew up in San Francisco yeah. and <laughs> I like when I was in grade school for Halloween, I would be like a Stanford cheerleader mm -hmm. because my dad went to Stanford yeah. and I always just assumed that I would go to Stanford mm -hmm. and fast forward. I'm, I'm at a, a, a very academically rigorous, um, grade school Hamlin. Mm -hmm. And then I chose to go to the most academically rigorous high school university. Mm -hmm. And I always thought I was pretty smart. <laughs> and then I, and then I went to high school and, um, I mean this, this school, it's one of those ones where like for years people, some classes just don't even, nobody graduates with a four O, but yet most people go to Ivy's or Stanford yeah. and 15 of my 92 classmates got accepted to Stanford. Wow. Um, I was like middle of the road. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I didn't even apply cause I, I didn't want to get rejected, frankly. And I knew that I would. So yeah, so that was really challenging for me because yeah, because everybody around me was, was so smart, um, and have become very successful. I mean, I could name a bunch of people that like have just done crazy things with their careers, Yeah. but I think what's inspiring to me about your story is that at a young age, you were able to figure out what it was that drives you yeah. and be able to see that. And I knew I was in a pressure cooker. I knew that like I was putting undue stress on myself and that like probably didn't really matter what college I went to, yeah. but I don't think I had the maturity until, and I'm still evolving um, to figure out what it is that that creates meaning for me. And I think, and the, and the first time I really started to dissect that was in college. I was at UCSB for two years and then I transferred to UC Berkeley, but I was very depressed and anxious and suicidal and all of those things. And I had this amazing therapist, um, who figured out that the root of my, um, despair, if you will, was not, not having anything in my life that felt meaningful. Yeah. And, and that was a big part of it because I joined a sorority and they were all nice girls, but like, mm -hmm. you know, they were really into partying and all of a sudden nobody really cared about their studies and, and it, and I didn't have any deep conversations with anybody for like, years. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I like to obviously get into the, you know, the, the meat of, yeah. of things and, and be able to share. And, um, and so she really challenged me to, to think about what feels meaningful. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, I actually like, I took some time to stop, stop taking any academic classes actually for a semester. And this was something my parents encouraged as well. And I only took art classes, dance classes, like art history, music history. Um, and, and that very much healed me. And then I became an art history major with yeah. no idea of what, where that would take me, but just because, because I, it felt meaningful to me. Um, and I mean, I, I'm anytime I get down, I'll do art. And like, I made this guy behind me and um, most of the pieces in our house. That's awesome. Oh, that's amazing. Thanks. Yeah. But I think that's, that's what I love about what I do as a recruiter um, now. And then also with this, this podcast is helping people figure out what that is. Yeah that, that drives them and that they love to do. And, um, it takes a lot of self -ref reflection and it takes stepping out of that narrative of, I have to be successful. Yeah. I have to go to Stanford. I have to live in a, you know, and I, <laughs> and I mean, I, I went to school with the heirs of gap and mm -hmm. Levi's and like, I mean, just crazy money. Yeah. And so that was also what I what felt normal to yeah. me growing up. And so, you know, and, and, um, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I think it, we're, we're always evolving. Right. But you, what I, what I've heard you say a lot is that 
and I think you said that maybe you kind of came to this conclusion um, when you were at Deloitte, yeah. but that for you, it's driving what impact am I making on my community yeah. and on the world and what skills do I need mm -hmm. to get there? Yeah. And so that was a question that I had for you as I was preparing today is, is what, what does that mean for you? What does impact mean? And, and, and what are you working towards to realize that right now? It's a pretty loaded question. So I'll try to kind of break it down to kind of my first principles, the way I think about it. Um, so impact for me is, uh, I think a culmination of three things. Um, number one is, how are you impacting others around you? Um, so your immediate circle, because the way I think about it is that circle of influence, which is, you know, it's you, the people around you, and then the community around that, right? So there's always kind of, just to kind of make things simple, it just helps me kind of think about the impact I'm making, even when I'm working customer success or as an engineer or in, in consulting, it's always going to help me kind of understand those kind of different circles around me. So number one is how, are you, how am I impacting the people that I'm working with, how am I impacting customers and so forth, right? So I think that's kind of the, from an impact perspective is just the people around me. So even on a daily basis um, with my wife and my pups um, and my family, like how am I really kind of interacting with them? Am I leaving a positive influence? And yeah. I, I heard this kind of somewhere recently, which is the difference between being kind and being nice. Because mm. I've always thought about them being kind of the same thing. Because you see somebody, they're like, oh, that's a, he's a very nice person. They're a nice person. But what does that really mean, right? And I think for me, it breaks down into like being that kind person to somebody. You don't have to be nice. Um, and being kind, I think a function of that leads you to kind of leave nice things at the end of the day. Nice is not as genuine. Kind is genuine. Right. Um, and I think that, um, and again, this is... I, I heard somebody kind of say that recently and it connected the dots for me, which is like, I think for me, impact really means for people around me, am I really being kind to them? And am I really, really leaving an impact there? The second piece is the community around that, right? So uh, I think it's that kind of imperative impact you're making. So if you're kind of making a positive impact and a kind impact on people around you, how are you kind of impacting the larger community? And I think that was important for me. And uh, at Deloitte, it really kind of dawned on me to be able to like make a larger impact. And that's why I moved to the Bay and started to kind of wanted to see what that massive impact looks like. Dollars and cents didn't drive me. What was more interesting for me is like, how is this reaching kind of millions and billions of people? Uh, and how does that kind of impact their daily lives and so forth? Um, so I think that community piece really kind of came in from the perspective of like, I want to join an organization. I want to be associated with people. I want to surround myself with people that are really kind of focused on that community impact at the end of the day, because I think the time for all of us in this world is limited. Hopefully it's like, it never ends, but it will <laughs> someday. Um, and what would be remembered? And I think thinking, and it's a little cathartic to think about it, but like thinking about your life backwards. Yeah. And I've had certain points in my life that I had to like literally kind of think about it. Like, okay, if this is my last day, how am I going to really define my life from kind of backing in, right? Because when you work with customers, when you're working with candidates um, and CEOs and leaders, you're always thinking about like, okay, who do you want to hire? What's the ICP? Like, who are my kind of best candidates yeah. that can bring to board? So you're always kind of working back from like what the ideal candidate might look like for the business and working back from that. Why don't we think about that for our lives? And why don't we design our lives the way if this is my last day, here's what I want Sarah to say about me. Here's what I want my friends or my colleagues to say about me, right? And building your life around that is critical. And I think that's how I've started to think in the last couple of years is thinking more like kind of backing in your life. But like if this is kind of my service and this is where people are kind of talking about me, what would they say about me, right? Um, it doesn't have to be nice yeah. things, but as long as it's kind things, I think it's more important. So I think the second dimension is like making the impact on your community, but thinking about like, are you leaving a lasting impact? And I think number three is that kind of the thinking life backwards, right? And um, living my day to day, thinking about the impact I'm creating. It could be a very small impact. It doesn't have to be able to go change the world today. Um, but even if I'm making one person's life better, um, or if I made two people's life better, but I haven't done a good deed yet, okay, I'm in like 
plus two, minus one, I'm at one. Okay, I'm, I'm on plus one, I'm okay for today. I don't want to be negative, right? Or neither do I want to be on zero. Um, so I think that's kind of important for me. Um, but it also takes a lot of, um, again, this, I would love to kind of hear your thoughts on this. It requires a lot of self-care as well, because you can't help others until you help yourself. Yes. So my question back to you is like, what do you do from a self-care perspective that helps you kind of really tackle the day-to-day kind of yeah. opportunities, struggles, wins in your life? Um, well, I talked about, ooh, move around here. Um, I talked about art. Yep. That's the um, quickest and easiest way for me to recharge. I also love taking baths. Nice. I always like to tell people we've had this house for over three years now, and I have not taken a shower, not once, not in here. Um, I do when I travel, yeah. but like, and people are like, you gross, you don't shower. No, I, I take, right. <laughs> I take baths. Yeah. Um, but I, I love baths. Um, but I, that's actually, I think the biggest driver of why I became an entrepreneur and why like, I don't think I could ever work for somebody else ever yeah. is that I still go through, I mean, <laughs> I was having a rough time like three weeks ago and I need to have that flexibility of giving myself permission to sleep in or take a nap or, you know, just clear my day. And, um, I love to like, we have a hot tub, um, that we, um, installed when we moved in and I, I love like floating Mm -hmm. in the water (laughs) for some reason. It just like that, that really heals me too. Sometimes video games, um, I love to play Zelda, Nice, <laughs> <laughs> but like, but I think it's, it's giving yourself that permission. Mm-hmm. Like I, I've had a really challenging year this year actually, because, you know, startups are not getting investments yeah. <laughs> like the VCs, like the market is like, I mean, even Sequoia laid off half of their talent team yeah. a couple months ago. And so, um, I used to have business coming and coming yep. and coming and coming and yep. coming. And, um, it just hasn't, it hasn't been that way this year. So, um, I think also thinking about like what it is that I'm proud of and, and that like, where does my self-worth come from outside of these like things that I'm achieving? Yeah because it's really easy to lean on that Mm -hmm. when, you know, things are going really well. And I talk about my daughter a lot and, and even just focusing on like, just being really present with her and like, yes, that's, that's me being a good mother and, and a service to her, but it also warms my heart too. So that's one big thing. But I think for me, honestly, Sunil, the, the biggest thing is just, I guess probably right about when I started my businesses, like I just had this mindset of like literally nothing is more important than my mental health mm-hmm. period. Yep. And so if I start getting into the anxiety, the yep. depression, it clouds, it clouds everything. Yep. And um, I have to take that time away from all of the things that I think I have to do, whether it's cleaning the house mm-hmm. or whatever. And, and my husband is, um, is so supportive of me and he, and he will step up when, you know, yeah. <laughs> I need him to, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to take a minute here. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I don't think people give themselves enough permission. And I frankly don't know how I would be able to do that working for somebody else, Yeah, take care of myself the way that I need to. Yeah. And it's kind of a double-edged sword because, sometimes I feel less than because when I have worked for other people Mm -hmm. and I'm not in a good place, like, I mean, crying and crying and having panic attacks at work and like, you know, stuff that you never want to do at work. And sometimes I feel like I'm not strong enough to do that. But at the same time, I think my mental health challenges have propelled me into a life that is more congruent with my values and 
um, has forced me to take care of myself um, and avoid burnout and um, and getting into those really really dark places. So I don't know if that answers your question, but um, it does. I really appreciate. I don't know. Life is tough. <laughs> it is tough, and but I really appreciate you sharing and being so open about it because um, I think those are one of those things that people don't talk about. Uh -huh. And uh, I think I love your thoughts also on like LinkedIn as well, right? Because sometimes um, mm -hmm. it can be an amazing place where you can learn so much, you can celebrate wins, but it can also be keeping up with the Joneses sometimes. Yes. Um, and I would love your kind of thoughts on that, right? Because I've, um, I've had a couple of people that have mentioned this to me in the past as well on how that can be... Um, something that can be pretty stress inducing uh, in terms of like, am yep. I keeping up? Yep. Right. Yep. Um, here's a person that did like went to high school with me. Here's a person that went to college with me. Look where they are. Like, and you kind of try to gauge your you know, life, your, where you are in your life. What else? I don't know. I probably don't want to use this word, but like self worth sometimes, right? Like, am I worthy enough? Right. So that's kind of where this like imposter syndrome kind of self-worth, like all of them like start to like creep in and you try to kind of compare. It even yeah. might be just as like a small post, right? And I've had that like a couple yep. of times in my life where I'm just like, oh, am I like, what am I doing, yeah. right? And sometimes it can be very motivating because then it's just like, oh, awesome. Like this person's doing this. Hey, like, how did you go about doing this? I would learn from you, right? Yeah. And that's how I've tried to approach it more recently. Um, but I would love to kind of have, can I get your thoughts, right? How do you process that when, not just, I mean, especially in this virtual world, you're not in like, you know, meetings or like conversations with people in person mm -hmm. that becomes a mirror of the community for you. Right. So how do you keep up with that? Yeah. I mean, and that's something that I've had to grow through this year because, um, I started trying really hard in the beginning of the year to post consistently. And there are all these ways to hack the algorithm. Yeah. Like you need to be consistent. Um, if you tag somebody, then they need to, if they interact with the post mm. within the first hour, then you get way more impressions yeah. and blah, blah, blah. And it just kind of like spirals. And so I was trying to kind of hack that and like create my posts ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And then, and there is that imposter syndrome of seeing other people and what are they posting? And it takes a lot yep. of time. And um, I was um, talking about this with my husband, um, like Nick Meta does a really good job mm -hmm. of, of posting really valuable, um, creating very valuable posts. And, um, and he says that, you know, I, I, I take the time every week to sit down and create it myself so that I'm providing value. And I, I think that takes a lot of intention and it's, it takes a lot of energy and it's very easy to fall in the trap of, Oh, I'm just posting to post to boost my numbers because in this virtual world where you know, we're not in offices together and we're collaborating. Like some of my best friends now, I haven't even met in person yet. Like Nikki, I'm going to meet him in a couple of weeks, but so your, your online presence becomes so much more important. And I, you know, it took me a couple of months to create this podcast and edit all the episodes and all these things. And as I was doing that, and my father-in-law had recently died and we were, going to the Cape to do the memorial. And I was doing all these, um, things to prepare for that. Um, and my husband's work got really busy. So I, I took a break from LinkedIn from, for several months. And I was like, well, when I post about my podcast, I'm not going to have that momentum from all of those posts that they say that you should have. So I think it's now, I mean, the cool thing is, and I've been so appreciative of the response that I've gotten from the customer success community. And I think it is a little bit insular, but also very supportive. And so I've found myself really connecting with people in ways that like, and it's, it's not just for clicks or impressions, but when I see those inspiring posts to, to comment on them and it's this reciprocal, like that's the way the organic value really comes from is it's staying in that space of authenticity and kindness and, and being there to learn and to, um, and to engage with other people. I think 
yeah, it's like anything else, you have to just quiet those thoughts that are not helpful and not serving you. Um, and we all have them. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of work to create that presence in the, you know, so, I mean, it's, it's tough. Like LinkedIn, it, yes, it is a, a professional platform, but you can fall into the same negative spirals that you can with like Instagram or Facebook. But I just make sure also to follow people that make me feel good. You know, like what, what, what is my reaction as I'm scrolling? If I start thinking, oh, I'm fat or I don't have enough money or I'm not successful enough, then like, I don't follow that person. And so I think we create our own realities through social media and to be very, to, to curate your own experience is also really, really important and make sure that you do follow the people that inspire you and make you feel good about yourself just as you would create your friend group. You know, you want to make sure that that people are are having a positive impact on you and you're the only one that can really make that decision of, of who that is. So yeah. No, I really appreciate you sharing that. And that's a that's a great perspective. And I think a couple of things came to mind as you were saying that, which is I think it's a something I've lived by most of my life or all of my life, which is treat others the way you would want to be treated. Um, but I think it goes the other way as well, uh, which is treat yourself the way you're treating others as well. Yes. Right. Um, I think everything starts with like self-care, having that kind of identity, um, not tying your identity with certain metrics, or if you are trying certain pieces to metrics, like keep it as like its own black box or white box, whatever you want to call it. Um, but, uh, have its kind of own sandbox for itself and like try to kind of have your life be def not be defined by it. Um, so I think that's kind of one thing, which is like treat yourself the way you're treating others. Um, yes. Be kind. Um, the second thing I can think of is as you're on the, the LinkedIn piece that we talked about, right? Um, turning it into the positive piece, which is like, I've sent like infinite messages to people is like, oh, I just like congratulations on what you're doing. Like, this is amazing. Um, can I get a little bit of your time to learn from you? Right. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's interesting. Like people like you and I that have been in the industry, like have done stuff, everybody's busy, but even if like off the 10 messages I sent, even if one person responds, I'm like, great. Like I want to talk to you. I want to learn from you. Right. Yeah. Uh, those remaining nine, maybe they'll come back. Maybe we'll cross paths. Um, but that one conversation I have and what I learned from them is like magic for me for the week. I'm just like, I've learned more than I've read like 10 books from you today. So thank you for your 10 minutes of your time. Right. Um, yeah. so I think that's kind of the number two is like thinking about like, what you can learn from others, but also like one thing I always leave every conversation with is like, how can I help? Right. Mm -hmm. And this might be like a four time CEO. This might be like a 10 time founder. This might be an engineer. That's a very distinguished. It doesn't matter like what they've done. There's always something you can do to help. It's like, I know maybe I can't help you, but maybe starting your next company, you can tell me 10 things about it, but I want to learn from you or I want to also contribute. Um, can I help you connect with yeah. some really smart people as you're like starting your company? Um, can I help you in some other way where I can be helpful? So not just having this one way thing. It's just like, I want to learn from you. Bye. We'll see you later. I have these 10 asks for you. Right. But what can you do? Just kind of asking that I think has definitely kept me real uh, in those conversations. Yeah. Uh, and I think number three is um, going back to kind of that self care piece, right. Which is, thinking about how do you want to define your life and how do you want to build your life and how do you want to run your own race? Right. And I think that has given me a little bit of perspective in terms of like having a little bit of like blinders on myself, because what I might do next is probably nothing related to the three phases I've done before. Maybe it's going to be something completely different. Um, yeah. And I think that's something that I've been thinking about a lot, which is like, um, whatever I want to do next, um, is that trying tying into kind of what I want to, be remembered for at the end of the day, right? Um, by myself, by my family, by mm -hmm. my community, am I making the right impact and so forth? So I think it's always redefining yourself is the the name of the game for me. Um, because I feel very like trapped if I'm doing the same thing for like five years, I'm just like time to do something else. Um, because I want to yeah, yeah. kind of learn and reinvent. Um, yeah. And I've learned a lot from you in the process, by the way. Uh, and you inspire me. Like um, every conversation I've had with you and the learnings I get, okay. uh, was either 
amount of people you're connected with, the impact you've made to different leaders like myself um, and others you've connected with. You always have like these wise words that I take away. I was like, Sarah said this, I like to have this kind of notes <laughs> filled with kind of things you tell me. Um, so I think it's important, right? I think it's always important to um, sometimes also ask like, hey, um, what's the impact I'm leaving on you, right? Um, and just be real. And I feel like it's important to always have that post-mortem uh, and pre-mortem in terms mm -hmm. of like thinking about things. And you've been a great um, inspiration for me in the last couple of years to have that sounding be as a sounding board for myself. Well, I, I can't tell you how much that means. And um, I get imposter syndrome all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and a lot of times I'm like, God, I'm just ranting. And, um, but yeah, I mean, just trying to share, you know, share what I can of myself. And, um, that's, that's what fills my cup yeah. is being able to have those meaningful conversations. Um, and one thing I wanted to definitely share, I think you did mention about this customer success community. It's yeah. probably one of the most like genuinely supportive communities that I've been part of um, and most genuinely like real people I've surrounded myself with because we all come from different paths, right? Like you leading uh, and hiring customer success leaders, um, me kind of managing these customer success teams. We don't, we didn't like start in that, right? And neither did a lot of yeah. other people. They've not like started in that journey. So I think there's a diversity of experiences that people come through and there's that understanding that like, we're trying to build something new. Um, and I think that number three is that it's evolving, right? Yeah. The version of customer success that used to exist five years back is not the same that was two years back. It's not the same that's going to be tomorrow, uh, especially right. with like AI and a lot of the other things that um, are already here. So how do I redefine my skills? Um, how do I redefine kind of what I'm doing today? Uh, and how am I helping others, right? I think those are, I think, three things that I feel this community is pretty kind of close-knit and very helpful to each other. Um, and that kind of inspires me as well as being part of like the community that's helpful because as we mentioned, right, people you surround yourself with is important, but also I think there's another side to it of not having it be an echo chamber, uh, be any part of any community, right? Um, it's yeah. important to not just hear the things you want to hear. And then it's like, okay, this is the truth. Uh, but also getting different perspectives and seeing like, okay, what is the next evolution, right? How can I upskill myself to be ready yeah. for that, right? Because CS used to be, and again, the world I grew up in is like very much sentiment based before I started in CS. And then a lot of the lead, great leaders I worked with kind of helped me show like, no, it's value based, it's revenue based and mm -hmm. tying yourself with those things, right? So I was always able to like be one step ahead, learning from other folks in terms of how it's done really well. Um, and it was uncomfortable to do that initially because you have to learn new skills to get towards it. Uh, but I think that would be my advice for anybody kind of listening in, thinking about like having this uncertainty of like, hey, how does this impact my role? Like, what does it mean for me? Um, and so forth is like upskill yourself, be ready for kind of what's coming up next, talk to people yep. um, and define what's next, right? As compared to like waiting for the game, you build what's next. Uh, you define within the organization what a CSM role looks like, what support looks like, what implementation looks like, enablement looks like, and so forth, right? So if you are able to take charge on that, you're already on the cutting edge of defining what's next. And everybody follows patterns as well. Like, okay, this is what in these companies, you have done this well, I want to learn from you, right? So I think be that person that's defining the path for others is kind of waiting for okay. somebody to define that for you. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, and in terms of like where customer success is going and evolving, I think, I mean, it feels like every day the larger business community is starting to realize how important customer success is, not just as like a support function, but really something that's driving revenue and product development and um, every, every piece of the organization really. And so, um, I actually decided recently that I'm going to start bringing on people that, um, are not in customer success, but are working with customer success orgs and, and, um, helping define that strategy. Because like you said earlier in the call, like customer success is, <laughs> It's not, it's not just a, a department. Yeah. It's not just a role. It's really part of the strategy. Yeah. And in, it, you know, this, especially in SaaS where like, it's really easy for your customers to move to a competitor, like that, 
that just is so, 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 so important. Yep. Um, and yeah, I think it's cool. And I think, and I think, and I think people are starting to get it, mm -hmm. but certainly like the companies that end up coming out on top, they are, mark my words, the ones that are going to really, really prioritize customer yep. success early and often. Yep. Yeah. And I think it's also important as, um, as CS is evolving, as the market's evolving, right? Because the way you would define a customer success motion for an AI company, because I've talked to a lot of uh, founders, CEOs, leaders, um, the motion's not the same as you would do in a B2B setting right. or a B2C setting. Um, so it requires its own set of kind of skills to be able to drive that. Maybe you have a multi-pronged strategy as a company now that you have your B2B, B2C products, now you're launching an AI product, right? What does that mean to serve customers within that, right? Uh, within that particular capability. So the motion needs to evolve, but the organization needs to evolve in terms of how to work with customers, yes. right? How do you educate customers, enable them to be on the leading edge of that, be one step ahead. Uh, and I think those are the teams that are going to differentiate themselves and those are the people that are going to differentiate themselves from the cream. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, and I just love, I mean, we talk about like the creativity piece for me and and how that helps and that's and that's probably what I love so much about working with customer success teams yeah. is like I never go in talking to a CEO with a playbook like I yeah. have I have you know concepts like typically implementation is the first yeah. or onboarding um whatever you want to call it and it's different at different companies but usually that's the first thing that I like to specialize but like it's always okay, well, what, what do you have now? Yeah. What are your, where are your blind spots? What are you looking to accomplish? Yeah. And we kind of build the profiles and the team from there. Yeah. And, and it's always, always different, yeah. which I think is really fun. So, and also like the way customers are buying today um, and how they're interacting is very, very different than how it used to be even six months back. Hmm. Um, so you also need to evolve your systems and your processes corresponding to that. So like if a CEO doesn't have customer success at the top of their priorities right now, they're missing out. Um, and if they're thinking that, okay, now we need to prioritize this, like one aspect of the business, um, while not kind of focusing on like CS being this kind of company wide thing that they need to do. Cause sometimes it can get like bundled under support or revenue or different teams. And it doesn't, yep. you know, it doesn't matter where it sits at the end of the day, but if you're prioritizing kind of how we unlocking value because existing revenue and NDR, as we know, like a company that's growing at a 20% clip every year, within five years, they can double their revenue without giving, getting a single dollar into the business. So if you're able to prioritize, how can you create massive value for the existing customers, how they can grow, and you have your new business engine, or on top of that, that's kind of contributing equally, if not more or less, you can really kind of drive that kind of company to the next scale, right? So I think Absolutely. just kind of prioritizing value, prioritizing success as a company function would become even more important. Uh, but I think that the way the game is played will be different uh, than how it's played today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, TBD. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so, so much. Um, I think we're probably at the top of the hour here, but yeah. Um, yeah, always, always great to talk to you. Same here. Um, and I think I'm going to leave with we all work in progress, right? We, I think I'm a function of all my failures more than my successes. So some kind of maybe parting thoughts. Number one is like always having that growth mindset is important and your failures shouldn't define you, but the learnings from those failures should define you and what you're doing with them um, and how you're kind of tracking mm -hmm. towards it. Number two, everybody's running their own race, um, but it's important to have that community around you where you're learning from and you're improving and growing. Uh, so highly, highly important thinking about, at least from my vantage point, the, the concentric circles, which is like, how are you impacting your life? How are you impacting people around you and your, commu and your community around that? And then eventually the larger community outside of that. Uh, number three, I would say would be thinking more about defining your life. Um, kind of in a reverse fashion. Mm, um, yeah. Like if this is my last day, how would I want to build my life around that, right? And I'm always going to throw curveballs and not everything's going to go or like according to plan. It's like having certain milestones, certain outcomes you want to achieve in life and how am I going to drive towards it? Especially like once you reach middle age, right? Like it's just hard to kind of know people that are early in the career have that drive. People that are like later, they know what to do, but then you're stuck in this like limbo where you're just like, there's so much more I can do, but I don't know what to do, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to start thinking backwards. Uh, and I think the last thing is um, 
being kind, right? I think that's mm-hmm. the last thing I would say. Um, be kind to yourself, being kind to people around you. Um, cause you don't know what others are going through. You don't know their journey. So like not yeah. judging others, not judging yourself, um, not judging the community. Um, but judging in from a perspective of like, how can we all move in the right direction and being kind towards that? So a lot, that's kind of my last thought is um, being kind towards yourself and the community around you. I love it. I love it. Words to live by. Yeah. Oh, well, um, yeah. I, I, I don't have anything else. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> this is great. I'm, I'm excited to, um, to watch this and massage a little bit and then, um, share it with the world. Cause there's lots of good nuggets in there. Awesome. So. Thank you so much, Sarah. You inspire me and I'm uh, inspired by everybody that's uh, going to listen to this and yeah, uh, I've listened to the first podcast. Uh, I try not to listen to the whole thing because I'm just like, Oh, these are like great ideas. I don't want to repeat this in my, my <laughs> conversation and, and so forth. But, um, I'm looking forward to kind of listening to other leaders and connecting with them as well, because uh, yeah. literally everybody you've had in your podcast, the lineup is so amazing. And also looking forward to other folks outside of the CS community as well um, yeah. Uh, yeah. that are going to be joining the podcast and listening to this because um, there's a lot we can learn from each other. So yeah, call to action for folks that are in the CS world. Uh, there are things that I can help you with. Uh, so I'm going to leave my kind of, um, you know, how can I help you kind of ask out there? Uh, so if there's anybody I can help you with, um, any kind of, uh, advice, thoughts, anything that can be helpful in your career, in this current situation you're going through, um, happy to be here for, for others that are going mm-hmm. through similar things or, um, or trying to kind of process that through. So thank you. Awesome. Yeah. And I'll make sure to, um, put your contact information Great. and however you want, um, people to, to reach out on your, your little show page. Great. So. Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, and we'll, let's chat soon. Sounds good. Thanks, sir. Talk soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to Success Unscripted. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating, writing a review, or sharing it with friends. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss out on future episodes. I post the video recordings on YouTube and you can find the audio version on most major podcast platforms. My goal is to bring you stories that educate and inspire you. So if you have any questions, thoughts, feedback, or you have someone in mind who could be a great future guest, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can find my information in the show notes or feel free to just reach out to me on LinkedIn. And I'll also include Sunil's LinkedIn profile in both the show notes and on unscriptedpod.com. I post episodes every other Friday, so I'll see you in two weeks. Thank you.